Okay, our next speaker um, is Tony Lynn Morelli. Tony Lynn is a research ecologist with the USGS at the Department of Interior Northeast Climate Adapt Adaptation Science Center. She matches ecological modeling and genetics techniques with transitional ecology approaches to facilitate natural resource management and habitat species conservation in the face of climate and land use change. It's a mouthful. She has uh, previously worked for the U.S. Forest Service, um, both as a research ecologist at the Pacific Southwest Research Station and as the technical advisor to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Her most current work involves analyzing climate change consequences on the northern forest ecosystems of New England and New York. Dr. Morelli um, will discuss climate change vulnerability and adaptation of forest wildlife. Thank you. Thanks to Jim. Thanks for the organizers. Um, this is quickly becoming one of my favorite meetings to go to, and so I'm so happy to be up here at the podium. I uh, am particularly excited about the FEMC because at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, it's our job to work with managers and to connect scientists to managers and science to management needs. Um, in kind of the service of climate change adaptation and improving management decisions in the face of climate change. And you can see our region is large. We go all the way to Minnesota and down to Missouri, but uh, Vermont and New England are, are solidly within our base and we're hosted by the University of Massachusetts. So we just sit over the border there. Um, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna do a quick review of what you just heard, but you were mostly already here, so I'll go quick. And then we'll talk a little bit about some specifics on um, impacts we know about, we expect to see, and how we can kind of monitor for them for forest wildlife. Uh, I wanted to join in with what Jennifer was saying to put in a plug for the um, National Climate Assessment that just came out. Uh, we just put it out a few weeks ago, and I wanted to uh, just add to her encouragement, Ira Flatos. Um, he actually said four times that it's super easy to read. <laughs> and I feel like um, if the host of Science Friday thinks it's easy to read, since he's going to be a super science communicator, then that's something. So he said this. Um, so there you go. I, I can't, couldn't say it better. We do have a lot of um, great visuals in the National Climate Assessment. Here's a general thought about how you can look to seeing climate change on the landscape. And I'll touch on a few of these. Uh, and you've already heard a bunch of them from that great speed talk intro from Jennifer in the beginning. Uh, so a few things. We know that um, temperatures are increasing. We can see that across the country. And we can see that, as she said, especially in the Northeast and especially in winter, something we care a lot about in New England. And we expect that to continue. So out of work that um, with, from collaborators at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, we can see that um, we expect winters to continue to um, be especially warm and the number of freezing days to decrease. And um, that's a percentage there you can see. So you can think about what that means. And I'll show you a little bit what, what that might mean in terms of the forest that we all care about. What's pretty remarkable is if we look at the changes that we're expecting in this area, we actually uh, see, you can see in, in red and sort of the pink uncertainty around it is the higher emission scenario by which we're on track right now to possibly even overshoot um, versus the blue kind of lower emissions. Both of them show us that in the future, the coldest winters we experience, so we all, many of us thought this last November was pretty chilly. Um, the coldest winters in the future will be like the warmest want winters we experience now. And the hottest summers that you can imagine, you can think back to a year that just was unbearable to be working out in, that's as cold as it's gonna be in the future kind of put things in perspective. I really liked how Jennifer said, I felt like maybe I could have the title of my talk be good times, but sarcastically, but I don't know how you do that in a talk title, so. <laughs> um, anyway, we're, I'm gonna get to some actions because the beginning is gonna be super depressing, I'm just warning you. Um, Jennifer already pointed this out. In the Northeast, we're being hit even harder. This is work out of the Climate Adaptation Science Center showing that the Northeast is being hit 
earlier than the globe at that two degree target. So two degrees for the world means three degrees for us. Ecologically, this means, as Maria pointed out, we're getting longer growing seasons, we're getting earlier uh, high spring flows, we're getting drier summers and drier falls, and we're getting shorter winters with less snow. And we have data on that from the National Phenology Network showing uh, how the season is, um, the growing season is getting longer and that um, the, it's, the spring is coming earlier. So Maria already showed us some of this. I'm just gonna kind of have one um, slide, general habitat vulnerability slide here to show you, and this is really recent data. Essentially, it's looking at um, likelihood of snowpack and kind of working through that and doing a calculation to say how do the forests, uh, how does that matter to the forests? And in the end, this F is what you can focus on to say um, that we're really gonna have this increasing forest vulnerability due to soil frost. So less snow on the soil means colder soils, means damage to potential damage to uh, trees because of um, root damage and soil frost. So this is just one of the aspects that may be counterintuitive um, of the impacts of climate change. But I mostly want to talk about wildlife and um, what we expect, how that will, how they'll be affected. We know that we're already seeing some local extinctions are widespread around the globe um, across taxa. We think that in particular, the Northeast will be vulnerable to this. This is just showing deep red as sort of the most vulnerable areas around the globe in terms of climate change. So there we are in, in that deep red. And there's all kinds of reasons to think that we should continue to see extinction risks. Um, and they will increase as we have higher emissions. So there's some, just some ideas of taxa and taxa traits that you might expect um, would lead to higher extinction rates. So um, just an idea that we are having sort of a global view of these extinctions. But we also have local data. And um, one of the ways that we think about how species might be responding to uh, climate change is through phenological shifts. So shifts in timing. And in fact, in, after the break, um, Mike Hallworth will be talking about some work on, um, at Hubbard Brook looking at phenological shifts in birds. This study is from Pennsylvania showing that uh, juveniles are um, being born earlier and earlier over the last 40 years of data they have. And that really coincides with temperature. So as the in temperature increases, um, the juveniles are being um, born earlier. Now, maybe that's okay, maybe that's adaptation, but it's really important that we know that that's happening, that we're monitoring that and then tracking the, the outcome of that and the fitness effects. So one way we can do this in more of a comprehensive and predictive way is to think about what makes species vulnerable and then um, particularly monitor or a, a, a adaptation for those species. There's different aspects of vulnerability assessments. Uh, you can think about exposure, so how much climate change is a species uh, experiencing. Sensitivity, how much do they care about climate change? And then adaptive capacity, do they, can they track their climate niche? Are there other ways, um, do they have a lot of genetic diversity? Are there other ways that they actually have the capacity to deal with vulnerability, to deal with climate change? We wanted to focus in particular on kind of the northern forest system and the southern edge of the boreal. So that's what I'm gonna talk about for a minute. There's that boreal forest, it kind of dips into New England here and it, we're particularly interested in it because um, the boreal forest gives us many of um, what we kind of think of, I think as our iconic, some of our iconic New England species. And they're also expected to be some of the most vulnerable. That's partly because um, of work just here out of UVM by Tony D'Amato and Jane Foster shows us that um, some of those species that make up the boreal forest, balsam fir, paper birch, and spruce, as Maria pointed out, are expected to decline in the future. And so we expect if those uh, habitats are declining, then we would expect the species to decline as well. Um, work from uh, Bill DeLuca, who's also uh, presenting after the break, has shown that those uh, spruce fir obligate species are in fact declining based on breeding bird survey data from the last decades. So for example, you can look at the black hole warbler and see that over about 30 year period, they've experienced about a 6% decline across um, Midwest and, or the Northeast range. 
So we've seen some, already some indications of that from the birds. We wanted to take a look and see what the mammals were doing. We put, we put together a rapid vulnerability assessment, assessment approach. This is um, based on experts. So uh, we went to managers and scientists think a lot about these species and said, how do you think these species are going to respond to changes in moisture and, and soil moisture and precipitation and air temperature and water temperature? And we went through and looked at the 75 northern forest mammal species. And I'm just going to flash this up really quickly. This is essentially the look at what seems to be um, the most sort of uh, explanatory way of thinking about this is that the species that are found more farther north I seem to be more vulnerable. That makes sense, right? That's sort of where we would intuit. Um, so that's what this figure says is sort of where is your range and here's your vulnerability. But I know you're not all um, mammologists, so I'm going to give you pictures. <laughs> um, you're welcome. So, um, and this actually, now I added an extra layer. So we not only ask people uh, how vulnerable do you think these species are going to be, but um, how certain are you about that? And so. Those scores actually fall out um, in a pretty interesting way in which species that we think are really vulnerable, mostly we're pretty certain about it. So I'll focus on a couple of those and some research and monitoring we have going related to them. So for, for example, um, there's data, uh, there's a project um, by a graduate student, Alexei Seren, who's also presenting after the break, on um, Canada Lynx snowshoe hare and snowshoe hare looking at um, using in collaboration with state and federal managers in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, set up a grid of camera traps so that he can monitor how um, Canada lynx are uh, moving across the year and across years, and looking at sort of elevational gradients, and also kind of be able to use uh, time substitution. So we have some really cold winters and some not, and snowy winters and some not so snowy winters. And has able been, he's been able to show that lynx are moving around the landscape in a way that we might actually be able to kind of predict they might do that in the future as we um, end up more in the sort of 2012, 2013 low snow years. Likewise, that was sort of latitudinally, he's also finding that the generalist species are moving in terms of elevation. Um, they can move up in elevation as there's in late winter when there's less snow. And so we might expect that we could extrapolate that these generalist species are going to be able to move up in elevation and up in latitude as we have uh, less snow on the landscape. Donovan Drummy and Chris Sutherland out of University of Massachusetts have been doing studies of martin density using their, um, their individually identifiable chest patches, showing um, kind of getting estimates from camera trap data and scat surveys of how many martin are on the landscape. Again, trying to see are these species um, declining and trying to kind of monitor for that. We can also think about moose, um, and we certainly know that in New England there's complicated stories about moose. This is video is courtesy of uh, Alexei Seren, and this is from a camera trap, and it's sadly the last days, it's probably really sad in this giant screen, um, the last couple days of this moose's life, and then you see the crows come in and they eat the winter ticks that have dropped off the moose, and then the last shot is a vulture coming in. And Alexei found this moose dead 20 meters away a couple of days later. Um, so we know that moose are very vulnerable right now. There's complicated reasons for that, but one reason certainly seems to be that as we have less snow on the ground we're, and um, changing precipitation regimes, we're getting more winter ticks. We also have problems with liver fluke and brainworm and other parasites and interactions with both moose density and deer density. But in general, it seems like climate change is bad for, gonna be bad for moose. Um, although there is an aspect of increasing forage related to the forest structure that may have some benefits. The moose story is complicated, so a bunch of us have come together with Wildlife Conservation Society and others to try to kind of do some scenario planning around this. Okay, what do we expect in the future and how can we manage moose given the uncertainty about um, what will happen with the populations? We've done this work in the Adirondacks um, as well as in Massachusetts. I have a really cool story about flying squirrel. I'm just going to have to tease you about it, and you're going to have to ask me at the coffee break about it. Um, and uh, I just <laughs> wanted to finally tell you that um, we're doing some work also on thinking about red squirrels and how they interact with important threatened bird species. So red squirrels are the major nest predator for 
Um, some of these birds, like the big mouse thrush and black pole warbler. So we're interested in how changing forests and changing climate might affect them. So we have a lot of data from decades of research. We expect that um, the red squirrels would maybe shift up slope, um, like some of the boreal bird communities have been shown to do. So far, we're not seeing that effect. That may be because we're expecting the forest to shift up slope, but as Tony D'Amato and his research group have shown, that hasn't happened yet. In fact, in some ways, it's, it's shifted down slope. And, so, and in fact, some of the birds have done that as well. Um, so we're trying to track some of that. There's this great work um, happening at uh, Dartmouth Second College Land Grant looking at um, doing some of the treatments that Maria mentioned. And we're also tracking some of the red squirrels there. How do they respond to some of these forest treatments? So we developed a, a wildlife magnet um, where we have some peanuts in it that they can't get to. And we have all kinds of animals that then come to it, like Martin and Fisher. <laughs> And we're pretty happy with this design because it seems to be even bear proof. We also get some red squirrels on the cameras. OK, so finally, in my last couple minutes, I wanted to move from being the, the, the sort of depressing story about climate change about kind of sort of what can we do about it. It's not actually about mitigation, but I don't know. I didn't know what to put here, and I wanted to put something happy. So um, Maria mentioned resistance strategy. So something I think a lot about is climate change refugia. This is the idea that maybe there's some places that are not as affected to clim by climate change Maybe we can protect them differently. So we're creating kind of a community of practice, the Refugia Research Coalition, finding these areas um, related to particular ecosystems. So one in particular that might be of interest to you is spruce fir. And you might identify the goal of what you want. You know, you want to keep spruce on their landscape or you want to keep moose on the landscape. Then where do we, um, how can we identify the places where they seem to be more protected from climate change? And Tony D'Amato and Jane Foster are doing that work, in fact, modeling refugia. They're doing this from a mechanistic perspective where they take into account stressors and um, disturbance. And you can see that you could map this, for example, in the Green Mountains. And if you look at this kind of army green color, you can see as we marched into the future, there's less and less army green, but there are places where it remains. And so um, you might then uh, focus on those places um, for different kinds of management. So we're doing this in all kinds of different ecosystems. And once you have those maps, you can then say, all right, so how would we manage those places differently? And so just finally a plug to say, we have some other work through the center that looks at, for example, how to think about invasive species and climate change. Might be something you'd think about for some of these refugia or just in general, thinking about managing habitats. And so there's data that will um, uh, Keith will be talking to you a little bit more about thinking about aquatics and um, how we can manage invasives given climate change. So with that, um, I just wanted to say we have a lot of information on our website that might be and uh, hopefully is of use and other tools. And I am happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions from the audience? No questions. All right. Well, Thank we you. have to give them an awkward level of silence first. I can do that. Think those questions up. <laughs> you don't have to come up here. You can we just have stand. Question here. I don't know. It's a short question. I, you, you, uh, you mentioned the red squirrel. And the big thing up here in the Northeast is the appearance of the gray squirrel in the last few years. I was wondering if anyone's studying the interaction of the gray squirrel with our more native wildlife. Yeah. OK, so the question is, gray squirrels are popping up. I know this last year it was crazy. Um, I, and so it'd be really interesting to know if there are data about that from the last several years, or if it's in particular because of this huge mass year that seemed to make the gray squirrels boom. And then they, they were up at, um, what, it was 1,300 meters or something. We were seeing gray I mean, it was crazy how high they were. Um, and all over the roads, you probably saw lots of dead gray squirrels too. So um, I think that, and, and so that's really interesting. We should check out the interactions of that. Absolutely, we know gray squirrels can beat up red squirrels. The other piece is to think about southern species moving in and what do they mean to native species, something I'm really interested in. Um, yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> you want me to tell my flying squirrel story? OK, I'll do it. It's a good monitoring story. So um, there is a northern flying squirrel. You know that. Um, 
we have it in Massachusetts, at least we used to, and now we don't anymore. And most people don't know that, which I think is a sad story about monitoring. So we actually lost a charismatic mammal out of Massachusetts and nobody noticed except for the mammal curators. And this is because the southern flying squirrel has come in, they're potentially tracking habitat or maybe just climate. They, um, so they're southern, they can deal better with these warmer climates. They are not the same at um, kind of moving around the lichens and fungus, so they maybe don't play the same ecological role. Um, but they also carry a parasite that doesn't bother them but kills off the northern flying squirrel. They're also bigger than the northern flying squirrel, so they basically just win out. And this has been shown in Michigan and Maine. They're starting to track it, so it's probably happening somewhere in New Hampshire and Vermont as well. We don't know where the line is. And I think it's just a, a reminder that monitoring is super important, and we should know what we're losing at the very least. Even if, sadly, we can't do anything about it, we need to actually have the information to decide what we're going to do, because if we don't know, then we certainly can't do anything. Thank you, and thank you.